Thanks, Nikki, and, and thanks for having me today. And um, so I'm at the moment a, a visiting fellow just over at uh, John Jay College and hiving away there doing, trying to get motivated to do a little bit of work while um, you know, taking in some of what New York offers, slipping into a um, St. Vincent gig, free gig the other night. That was a really good thing to do while I was here. Um, so it's, yeah, uh, it's a great pleasure to, to come and chat to you guys today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this fairly informal, so feel free to, to, to ask questions, to stop me, to, you know, uh, yeah, to, to, to say something. And maybe I'll ask you guys some questions along the way as well to try and get some engagement. So we'll see how things, uh, things pan out. So I'm going to be talking today, um, I guess pretty generally about the, the kind of concept of fear of crime and also then introducing a bit of research that uh, I've been doing with the City of Sydney Council on fear of crime over the last uh, few years, we've uh, run a, a survey and sort of qualitative interviews with, with people of, of, of the city of Sydney uh, to try and better understand what people's concerns about crime are and how they're expressed and how they actually might be reflected in different types of behaviour um, and different types of uh, expressions about, about crime. Um, you know, crime itself, I, you know, I, as you'd know from from, from Nikki's work and others too, you, the, crime tales are moral tales. They tell us something about ourselves. You know, w you're, you're interested in crime, you're interested in criminal justice, um, you're interested in those stories because they, they, they say something much more than, uh, than just about the crimes themselves. They tell us something about who we are and who we're not when we think about um, various types of crime narratives. And, and even whether we, you know, we, we, sh we share our fears and concerns about crime, they again tell us kind of who we are and, and who we aren't. So, um, I've just put, put a little plug up for uh, this uh, recent book that just came out, which was, it's got about um, 33, 34 chapters uh, from different people who have worked on fear of crime right around the world. So uh, there's, there's chapters from China, there's chapters from South America, there's European chapters, there's chapters from the US. Um, it's a, it's a you know, really big sort of companion piece to tr trying to understand the latest research around perceptions of crime, around, uh, around why we worry about crime and, and how we worry about crime. So, this is kind of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about, first, this idea of fear of crime as a, as a negative force, um, something that we want to reduce, something we hope no one has to worry too much about. But then I want to move on and think about how our worries about crime can also be, you know, maybe productive, maybe functional in some way. Maybe they, they serve kind of some sort of function um, in society rather than just being necessarily a negative thing. I want to then f start to think about a little bit about the politics of, of fear, the politics of fear of crime and what that, what that means. You know, do we, do we just fear, you know, this, this kind of threat of becoming a victim of crime or is there something more? Are we, you know, kind of worried about the change of pace in society? Are we worried about the kinds of um, governments uh, that we that we have and the way they behave, um, and, and you know how much does this create a level of, of, of what we might call ontological insecurity? The idea that we don't you know particularly feel comfortable in our in our place in the social world, and then we're going to move on to you know some I guess some examples from our data that that just just touch on that a little bit. Uh, towards the end. Um, so that's pretty much what this presentation is going to look like. So let's just sort of start from the beginning. And I should say, um, I've, I've spent, you know, the, I, I wrote my PhD on um, perceptions of crime on, and uh, so I've spent a lot of time thinking about this kind of stuff. Um, but the terms we use to describe this are also really important and they're sometimes sort of used interchangeably, but they, they kind of do conjure up different things. 
So, you know, uh, is it, are we worried about crime? Is it just, is it a worry? Is, is it a fear? Is it a, is it a perceived risk? Um, you know, the, the, the way we think about the concept of a fear of crime, if you like, as it's come to be known, um, is important and has implications for the way we then perhaps try to reduce it, or try to govern it, uh, try and manage it. So all you know, all of these these concepts are kind of interchangeable, but they, they have different they have different sorts of um, implications. And it also depends if you're using a qualitative approach or a quantitative approach in your research, how you understand the concept of fear of crime. That is, are we trying to count it? Are we trying to, you know, look at you know one population variable over another, you know, do, do older people fear crime more and, and, and is that because they, they're they more likely to, you know, answer a question such as, um, have you worried about crime in the last 12 months, uh, you know, and, and answer that positively that they have. Are we trying to count it or are we trying to do it qualitatively? Are we trying to understand people's stories and what they mean? You know, when, when, when you try to enumerate fear, um, enumerate our worries about crime, it can have quite different implications than just having a discussion about it. So th these things are important. So in, in survey work, in, in trying to, you know, sort of quantitatively uh, enumerate fear, there are a number of elements that most recently have been used to understand this. So there are kind of cognitive elements, which, you know, are really those sort of evaluations of risk that we might have. And we all do this, right? So when you, you know, if you're, if you're out of a night, um, you, you know, take certain precautions, but you, you base those precautions on evaluations of whether the environment's safe or not, I suspect. What do, what do people do? Do you do, you do that? I ask you a question. So, do, do you? How do you? Do you evaluate? Do you do, you do your own sort of risk management when, when you're out, or you're not bothered by it at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you'd avoid a, a particular area. Yeah. You will avoid a certain area. Yeah, yeah. And 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 what what on what basis do you avoid that area? So how do you make that decision? Yeah, so you, you go in a group because you think that, 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 that that's going to reduce your, your risk, your, your, you know, you're, you're kind of evaluating a particular situation, you're saying, well, I'd probably not, rather not go myself, I'd, I'd rather go in a group, and that's likely to keep me safer. So these are, they're, they're the sort of, you know, cognitive elements, this, this evaluation of risk that we make. Um, but there are also expressive elements of fear, and that's kind of how we talk about it how we, we think about it, you know, beyond, beyond, the, the, beyond the risk management part of it, we, we have discussions and you might discuss with your friends, you know, hey, we can't go there, the crime rates are too high, we've got to, we've got to go together, right? So, so, so there's, there's these interlinking kind of psychological elements, if you like, of building up a picture of concerns about crime, the sort of expressive nature of it. And in the stories that we tell one another, we talk about crime, right? We go, this happened to, you know, somebody when they went to that area. So we need to do this. So the expressive and that cognitive kind of link up in that sense. <clears throat> and then the other kind of key element, I guess, is the behavioural side of it, the connotative side of it, cognitive side of it, right? So how do we then behave on the basis of those expressive kind of conversations on the basis of the risk evaluations we make, we're likely to change our behaviour as a, as a result of these things. And so I guess the, the kind of psychology of, of fear of crime has tended to think about those three kind of in, interlinking elements as, as being important. Or, or, so, so we can measure those things in different ways. And, and the way it, it, to... If we, if we want to understand, you know, the kind of whole, I guess, you know, the, the recent research in this area is kind of saying, if we really want to understand people's perceptions broadly, we have to think about all those various elements. We can't just 
try and measure or understand one of those. We've got to understand, you know, how um, you know perceptions are formed, um, how we evaluate risk, how we discuss um, our concerns, and then how we might um, change or modify modify our behaviour on the basis of those. So it might be that we have these discussions and we think about these negative elements of fear and what we might do, but we might have no, there might be no behavioural change at the end of that. We might not change our behaviour. We might not go in a group. Um, does that mean that there's no fear of crime, if you will? Well, you know, not necessarily. But if we only measure the behavioural part of it, or only try to understand the behavioural part of it, we could make that conclusion. So hence the need to sort of understand the, the fullness of this kind of concept of, of worry or fear about crime. Okay, so I'm just going to leave that sort of hanging um, and then move on to kind of say that, okay, fear and worry about crime has kind of had a bad rap. You know, it's seen as a negative force, seen as something to try and reduce. Uh, if people fear crime too much, um, this, is, this is seen as a bad thing. And what we want to do is make people safer, right? To, well, you know, maybe. It, it, maybe, or maybe it's not that simple. What, how do we decide what's a normal amount of worry about crime? What's a normal amount of fear? I mean, this is a, this is a kind of constructed idea as well. Um, and ha and how, do, how do we decide what's a normal amount of fear for a particular demographic of person? Um, yeah, that's, that's a really good, you know, good way of, of thinking about this. So if it's, if it's affecting your quality of life, if it's negatively affecting your quality of life, um, then obviously we start to think this is, you know, this is not a great thing. Um, we, 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 we don't want to have that, uh, those negative effects. We don't want it to, to stop us going places. You know, we don't, want it to st we don't want it to stop us being a sort of relatively free you know, citizen of the city, if you like. And, and I'll, I'll return to that, actually. So I guess the point I'm making at the moment is that fear of crime is a kind of interesting concept. It one, it's one that requires definition. It's one that requires a, a, a lot of conceptualisation. Um, it's, you know, for 50 years now, uh, almost exactly 50 years, we've been trying to measure and understand fear of crime in, within criminology and the social sciences. Uh, and yet, there is still so much um, that's kind of problematic of, uh, in terms of the way we understand it. We're still, we're still grappling with this concept. And it's, you know, it's because the two key elements of it are quite complicated. You know, what, what, what is fear? Um, you know, this is a kind of constructed concept, obviously, in, in and of itself. And what is crime? I mean, as, as students of criminology, you know that, that crime itself is a, is, is a construct. You know, that, that um, our, our legal and cultural understandings of particular behaviour define things as crimes at certain points in time. So the idea of fear of crime is, is a kind of slippery one. And I've, I've been really kind of negative about the concept itself. I've, I've thought that it's really a problematic thing. So um, I originally wrote my PhD on this, uh, which was turned into this book, uh, which is called Inventing Fear of Crime. And it was, a, it was really a provocation um, to try and think about uh, perceptions of crime in a different way and, and how much d d does our own research into perceptions of crime actually create the concept that we then, you know, um, seek to research even more. Uh, and, and so what, what I tried to argue in, in this book, in fact, was that um, fear of crime as a, as a criminological concept, as a construct, um, was actually constructed in 1967. You can put it actually a fairly kind of clear date on uh, when it was constructed, because it came out of um, the U.S. President's Commission into into crime and justice when they first started um, trying to survey and measure fear of crime to try and understand uh, crime in a different kind of way. Because prior to that, 
the way we attended to understand crime rates was only through police reporting. Um, what the surveys that came out of the President's Commission tried to do was for the first time to use victim surveys. Um, and almost as a, almost as a, as a kind of add-on to these victim surveys, which was asking about victimisation, they asked these perceptions of crime questions. And now the, 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 the surveyors, the, the original researchers who were involved in this, had no idea what they were actually measuring. And they actually say that if you kind of read the footnotes of, of these early reports. They really didn't know what they were measuring. But in adding these questions, and the, the key one was, how safe would you feel walking in your neighbourhood after dark, right? That was the kind of key question and the first measure, really, of, of fear of crime. How safe would you feel walking in your neighbourhood after dark? Now, I think that question is really problematic for a whole range of reasons. Um, one, some people just don't walk in their neighbourhood after dark, whether it's to do with crime or anything else. It also assumes you're an able-bodied person and able to walk in your neighbourhood after dark. Um, and... I would also argue that it's a, it's a, for some people it's a fear-inducing question. Um, the, the, the whole idea of if, if I'm being asked this question um, might actually make people worry uh, about walking in their neighbourhood after dark. Um, so these little extra couple of questions that were added to surveys done during the, the US President's Commission uh, into, into Crime and Justice essentially began to invent this concept, to, to create this concept of fear of crime. And then, you know, the, the, the response to this question became called, you know, came to be called fear of crime. And then, of course, once we realised that kind of half the population are, are quite fearful of crime, more research was going on to try and understand that more. And it became what, you know, what I call in the book a, a feedback loop. That is that you know, the more we kind of found fear, the more we wanted to research it, um, the more we actually created the concept to the point where politicians then could talk about how fearful populations were based on this empirical research um, and, as a result, scare the hell out of the population as well, who then reported back to the surveyors once again that they were, um, they were, they were fearful. So. Uh, that's why I, I, I talked about this, this idea of inventing, inventing fear of crime, that we kind of came up with a, a concept and it reproduced itself. That's not, to, that's not to suggest that people aren't worried about crime. It's just to suggest that as a criminological concept, um, maybe the people researching it had something to do with actually you know, producing and, and, and creating more concern. <coughs> um, there are obviously a whole lot of demographic determinants around fear of crime and, 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 and really that's one of the reasons also that research into the concept uh, really gathered a pace. That is the idea that in particular um, the early work in this area suggested you know, women are much more, were much more fearful than men of uh, of various forms of crime, and of course, as research tended to, back in the you know the late 60s, early 70s, that suggested there was there's kind of something wrong with women fearing so much when they seem to be less likely to be the, the victims of crime. And uh, and I would argue again that that then drove the research agenda uh, to try and understand this sort of excess fear as as it was kind of constructed by researchers at that time. And this is called the risk-fear paradox. I mean, called the risk-fear paradox. That is that, um, you know, it's argued that in terms of some demographics, uh, those that are least likely to be victims um, were more likely to be more fearful. And, you know, elderly people is an example here. Um, that, you know, the elderly were, were seen to be more worried about crime, and yet, statistically, they were much less likely to become victims of crime. 
And of course, we, we don't have to dig too far to start to flesh out some of the reasons why that might be. You know, feelings of vulnerability, um, less likely to become a victim because they're just less likely to go outside in the first place. You know, there are, there are a whole range of, uh, of reasons why that might be. But nonetheless, it helped drive a, a kind of research agenda. Okay. Um, but even before all this research into fear of crime, uh, there was this sense that, there, that fear could serve some purpose. And, you know, I've just got your long quote from, from uh, Freud here, but uh, th th there could be other examples, you know, that, that really suggest that, uh, that fear um, in our lives plays kind of some sort of functional part of, to, towards keeping us safe, um, you know, th that it might not necessarily always be a negative thing. Uh, but perhaps it is when it starts to change our our quality of life. These are the sorts of things we might want to think about. So perhaps it's possible to have um, a productive fear. Um, you know, fear, uh, fear, fear, thinking. So, so, so what some researchers have been doing, and I guess I've been following this a little bit myself, is to try and think about, you know, what, what a, a positive relationship to fear of crime might mean. And what, that, that perhaps all the behaviours that flow from being worried about crime might not necessarily be negative, uh, that there might be some, some sort of positive outcomes. So what are, you know, what are, what are these productive capacities? And, you know, and really early on, though, I think fear came to be seen, you know, and I mean, this is not new, it goes, you know, if you, you look at the history of religion, it's actually all about fear and governing people through, through fear of what might happen to your, um, you know, you in the afterlife if you don't behave in your, your current life. Uh, so fear has always been used as a, as a mode of governance. Um, but we, you, know, you know, we can kind of see this from the, the, this quote from the British Home Office that they pretty early on thought, you know, a little bit of fear could be, can be helpful in some way in persuading people to guard against victimisation. Arguably, however, being mentally prepared in this way is better defined as awareness or concern, not fear. Fear itself can slide into hopelessness, terror, either of which can be counterproductive in terms of taking reasonable precautions. Uh, so, so pretty early on, um, you know, governments and policy makers understood that, that fear might have something to offer, or at least worry uh, might have something to offer in terms of getting people to govern their own behaviour. And I mean, we're hit with this stuff all the time when you think about it, you know, little signs of don't leave your valuables uncovered in your car or, you know, um, yeah, make sure you've got alarms in your house. I don't, I'm not sure what it's like here, but, you know, in, in Australia, you, you, you now, you, to try and change behaviours, for example, you can't get insurance unless you've got a particular type of alarm or window locks in your, in your house. So you're, you're actually sort of governed to, to do all this stuff. And, and it's often through a little bit of an element of fear um, that this, you know, this, these kind of positive, if you like, behaviours are, are encouraged. <clears throat> so we could, you know, and I'm not, I'm not sure how much kind of work around theory that you've done, but we could link that up with some of um, uh, w the work that flows out of uh, Michel Foucault's work around self-governance, you know, that we're, we're meant to be self-regulating subjects. Um, we're meant to, re you know, this, this little bit of fear is going to help us somehow regulate ourselves uh, and keep us, keep us kind of safer. So, that's all well and good if we feel secure, if we, you know, if, 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 if this doesn't slide into, um, you know, a kind of fear that is uh, affecting our, our quality of life, if you like. Um, but how much worry about crime is actually linked to a whole set of other worries in society. You know, like, like one of the things that 
the you know, some of the research has been showing us is that you know fear of crime is actually can be a reflection of being a whole, worried about a whole range of other things. You know, just financial security, for example. If you don't have these other forms of security in your life, um, if you don't feel, you know, ontologically secure, um, it's likely that worries about crime are going to be, uh, you, you know, well, this might be reflected into worries about crime as well. So, you know, th these days, uh, in, you know, I guess in the, the first 20 years of, of, of this century, there are a whole lot of insecurities that we face that perhaps we didn't face earlier on. You know, people can't afford to buy homes anymore. Um, people don't have jobs for life anymore. Um, we're worried about world political affairs and what that might mean for us. There's a whole range of insecurities, um, a whole range of things that are likely to create a sense of disorder in our lives. Um, and this could well be then reflected in our worries about crime. In fact, if, but if it was just all about ontologically insecurity, we might actually, we might think now that our fears about crime should be higher than they've ever been. Um, but in fact, they're, they're not. And well, actually, one of the chapters in that new um, handbook uh, that uh, I was showing you at the start, one of those chapters, uh, one of the researchers tracks levels of fear of crime on a, on a worldwide basis and suggests that there is actually a drop in worry about crime going on that has followed uh, what we might call the crime drop that's, that's occurred over the last 20 years or so. But it's way lagged behind it. And this is another interesting thing about, about fear of crime. While you know, crime rates might come down, people still believe that they're high. It's really hard to change that perception. You can cha actually change the reality. It's probably changing the reality of crime rates is probably easier than changing the perception. And so what we can say we've seen is this, you know, this, this, this massive crime drop, which you, you saw in parts of the US, and I know it, 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 it's not equal, and some of it's gone back up, and a whole range of other things. We had this massive crime drop, but for years, no real drop in worry about crime. People were still worried. Actually, people didn't believe that crime had dropped. I mean, I, I, I ask this with my class, you know, every year when I have a, a new lot of students, you, you know, has crime gone up or down? And, and people say it's either it stayed the same or it's gone up. Um, and it's been, it's been dropping for 20 years in Australia as well. Um, so what, what we see with perceptions of crime is they're really hard to change. And it's taken, you know, a, a kind of 10-year lag, if you like, to, to start bringing fear of crime off the boil. Um, as, as much as as much as crime rates itself. So, in, in fact, if we look at and I'm, I'm getting get off my my kind of lecture schedule, but if we if we look at policing, um, and I'm not I'm not sure about the situation here in the U.S., but about 10, 15 years ago in Australia, uh, maybe even a little more now, the police started to focus much more on trying to you know they they weren't just about. Um, trying to deal with crime, they were about also trying to deal with fear of crime, reduce fear of crime. And that became one of the, the mandates of the New South Wales Police, where I live, um, was to, to also reduce fear of crime. Um, but they, they, about five years later, they seemed to toss that mandate out the door. And I, and I think they did because they realised, God, it's hard enough fighting crime. Fighting fear of crime is actually harder. <laughs> We, we, we can't shift this. If this, is a, if, this, if this is a key performance indicator for our police service, um, we're going to fail. Uh, so we'll get rid of that. We'll bring in a key performance indicator that perhaps we can meet. Um, so, yeah, it's, a, it, it's been a difficult thing to shift. <clears throat> so does uncertainty equal fear? Well, you know, perhaps not necessarily. Um, but it, it certainly has some kind of impact. Um, I kind of covered a lot of this, so I won't go back over it again. Um, but of course, we've also got to think about these days the 24/7 the um, news cycle, and you know I haven't really talked about the news media much at the moment. But obviously, the way uh, media reporting.
happens has an effect on the way we, are, you know, our, our perceptions of crime as well and how much of it's going on. Um, we, we know the old adage, if it, if it um, bleeds, it leads in terms of, um, you know, uh, what news programming, still very much the case. Um, but we can, you know, we can sit there watching on, on media, on social media, in the news, wh wherever, uh, you know, crime from around the world, um, if we want to, and, and terrify ourselves with it on a 24-7 you know, kind of basis. So again, you'd think that might create more fear as well. But again, it's not, it's not necessarily the case. We also have a distrust of our institutions, and that is, has seemed to be connected to worry about crime. You know, if we don't trust our police, if we don't trust our government, if we think what they're telling us is actually just fake news, um, you know, then we're also likely to not, you know, not trust what they tell us about crime. If, you know, police departments or whatever say that, well, you know, but crime's reducing, we should, we should be less worried. Um, well, we can, you know, just discard that for some form of fake news if we, if we want to. You know, we don't, we don't believe these statisticians telling us that, that crime's coming down. And that sort of moves me on to this question of the politics of fear of crime as well. You know, we, we, we think we might just make these evaluation judgments based on, uh, of, of, you know, of our, our worry about crime based on the way we interact with, with the world. Well, it's really not that, not that simple. And we can kind of see that for around the politics of, you know, whether people think um, a terrorist attack is likely in the US. Just overnight, when Obama became president, in, in the United States, suddenly um, all these re Republicans thought that a terrorist attack was much more likely and Democrats thought, Democrat voting people thought it was much less likely. Um, so, so, so the way we attach our worries and concerns to things also are inherently political and, and, you know, and con con connected to a, a particular type of um, or, or way of thinking about our politics. So we, you can see the jump there when uh, Obama's elected on the you know, 4th of November, uh, 2008. <coughs> Another point I want to make about fear is, do you, are younger people as worried as, say, my generation were? Um, and the, the question seems to be maybe not, that they have a different relationship to fear of crime. You guys can probably answer that yourselves better. Better than um, better than me, but uh, you know, the time I was growing up, crime was really talked about everywhere. It was seen to be a period in which crime was increasing. Um, you know, we were we were kind of discouraged from going to certain areas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, even though our crime rate is much lower than uh, in Australia is much lower than yours in the in the U.S., it doesn't seem to really. Um, matter too much, you know. Uh, crime and worry about crime was really, really on the political agenda. Um, but maybe that's changing, and and you know, and the millennial population uh, or demographic have a have a different relation to it, relationship to it. Um, and this is this is just a quote from uh, Jonathan Simon, who actually actually this is I've, I've got forthcoming here, but this is actually out. It's a chapter in the 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 book as well, but um, Jonathan Simon's been thinking about this and he says, for baby boomers, the cultural imagery of the crime decline that began in the 1990s has been slow to take hold. Many will always be afraid um, to walk home alone in the dark. Millennials, the generation that's now reaching into the social uh, and cultural and political influence, seem to have a very different relationship to crime and to fear of crime, having grown up in the urban, suburban habitat shaped by it. But their relationship to it is one of irony. Millennials are not indifferent to victimization risk, but that is just one of the many fears that occupies a, gener a generation 
of economic precariousness, of deep political dis disillusionment. Others include historically potent candidates as ruinous debt, long-term unemployment and homelessness. Compared to baby boomers, they're much likely to see fear of crime resentfully as a side of being governed, as a burden to their freedom and their sense of equal dignity. So for Jonathan Simon, um, you know, he's suggesting there's a generational kind of change that might mean that it's not that you know, millennial generation isn't worried about crime, it's that they've got a whole bunch of other things uh, that might be equally worrisome uh, and that crime is one of those impediments to kind of everyday, uh, everyday life. Is that all making sense so far? Got any, got any questions about anything up to this point? So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, my recent research at the end. And, 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 but, so that's all the sort of conceptual stuff, really. Why do you think people want to see mm. crime? Yeah, I think that, that is a, a really good question. People, people seem to, be, to just be ravenous when it comes to um, consuming crime stories, I think, you know what I mean? We, we see it not only in the, not only on the, 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 the news and real crime side of things, but, but in, in terms of yeah, reading about crime, watching television programs about crime, we, we just seem to want to consume this. Um, but I, I think it comes, I think it does come back to some of those questions about, uh, you know, crime, crime stories being morality stories as well. Um, and that uh, we, we, we kind of like being scandalised by this stuff uh, because it, it kind of clearly tells us who we're not. We're not those, we're not those criminals, um, you know, committing these crimes. And it's all, it also becomes just a topic of conversation. I, as any student of criminal justice knows, like having a, having a, um, a dinner conversation with your parents um, who start to go on about the, you know, the state of the world and how b bad crime is and why aren't these people being locked away forever, etc. Um, you know, th th these become kind of stories that we share. And I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't have a clear answer to that question, but I, I think that starts to, um, you know, starts to address it. But it is, I, I think that it's, that's the kind of million dollar question, really. Why do we want why do we want to be kind of scandalised and, and kind of terrify ourselves about these things? Um, create this sense of risk uh, within us and then, and then somehow try and manage it. Okay. So, what I think a lot of the recent survey work has done has actually shown that, in fact, people aren't as fearful as a lot of the early research tended to indicate as well. And if we ask the right sort of questions, um, we, we can, if we ask different sorts of questions, we actually pretty much re reduce about half of the fear of crime that we might have measured through the question of are you, um, you, are you worried work, walking in your neighbourhood after dark, right? So say, say we had, you know, kind of 50% of the people saying, yes, I am worried about walking in my neighbourhood after dark. We'd probably get rid of, you know, about half of that, get down to about 25% by changing the question. Ah, yeah, the, well, the, yes, the crime rate going down. I, I don't even, you know, I, I don't want to go there now. It's just such a hard thing to address because I think there are so many factors um, at play. Whether it's one of the reasons that it went down, there's probably an element of target hardening that helped reduce um, levels of crime, but I, that would only be one, one, one reason. I, and by target hardening, I mean, you know, that yes, people take precautions, make crime more difficult. Yeah, it's probably going to have um, an effect on some types of crime. Um, but I, I suspect, in terms of the the crime decline. Um, there's a whole lot of things around cult just cultural change that uh, we, we tend not to take into account because they're much more difficult things to, to kind of measure and understand. Um, you know, our change in relationship to certain types of drugs, for example, 
um, that, that certainly went on over that period. Um, you know, people getting just getting fed up with high rates of, of crime as well. I, I, I think there's a, a lot went into it, you know, and police departments can um, take the glory of, of, uh, of, of having um, reduced crime in, in various cities, but I suspect they have very little to do with it. <laughs> um, there's, a, you know, a whole lot of other stuff going on. <clears throat> um, so whether, whether, whether our concerns about it had any impact, um, maybe they drive us to, you know, different sorts of policies that might have an impact. That's, that, that, you know, that, that's certainly a, uh, a possibility. Although, you know, you'd have to say that the crime decline happened um, almost uh, in a way that completely defined, um, sort of redefined any sort of criminological understanding of, uh, 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 of what might drive crime rates. Um, and left criminologists completely stumped because everyone was kind of going, well, actually, crime, you know, given what we understand about crime, it should keep going up. But it started to drop pretty, pretty dramatically. Um, so, it, you know, I think it, it, it confounded uh, a lot of expectations. Okay. Um, so, just yeah, getting back to that, that, that question of how we, uh, how we ask about fear of crime. So, you know... Okay, so as I said, one early way of doing it was to say, well, you know, how safe would you feel walking, you know, in your neighbourhood after dark? And that tended to find, to, you know, to find fairly high levels of, of worry. Um, but we can change that really easily by even, even a variation of that question, by saying, how many times in the last 12 months did you feel fearful walking in your neighbourhood after dark? Now, still not a good question, but just by asking, how many times in the last 12 months did you feel it? You're, you're, you're changing the way we understand that pretty dramatically. And what you're, what you're doing is you're changing it from an ex trying to understand an expressive type of fear, something that someone might just think this is, you know, yes, I, I would feel fearful in this situation, to actually... Um, what we might call an experiential type of fear. That is, someone's had to actually have felt that fear. If they say, yes, you know, I've, I've felt this in the, last, in the last 12 months. So by just changing the question like that, we pretty much get rid of about half of that fear we've measured by the, the earlier question. Um, it's measuring different things. If you really want to just measure that expressive fear that could be anything, yes, you can, you can ask the first question. But if you actually want to understand, I think, on a level where you might actually be able to make some impact from a policy perspective, um, you, you really want to understand people's experiences more. And, and that also cuts out some of that stuff about, well, I'm, you know, I'm just worried about my financial situation, so I'm going to say that I'm concerned about crime in this survey <laughs> um, because it's, it's making you think about these you know very experiential moments um, and that perhaps you know you could think for a moment yourself if, if if you were answering a survey you know what those what those different questions might elicit in your own response now you know, can you actually think about X amount of times that you did feel worried <coughs> so so that's one of the things we've been trying to do in our research is to change is to change the questions and try and try and um, come up with the best set of questions we can. And and I don't pretend to be incredibly original with this. There's some work in the UK in particular that had been um, very influential in in these sorts of in changing these sorts of questions. People uh, such as John Jackson and, and Stephen Farrell working in this this area in the UK, uh, who I've worked closely with. They were, they were really trying to re redefine these kinds of questions. And so that's what, that, they're the sort of things that we, um, we tried to ask. The other thing that we tried to ask is something much more about specific types of crime. So, you know, have you worried about being assaulted in the last 12 months? Have, ha, you know, have you worried about being sexually assaulted in the last 12 months? 
uh, have you worried about having your ho home burgled in the last one? So making people think about particular types of um, crime rather than this kind of generic, are you worried about walking in neighbourhood after dark? So putting all that together, what you actually see, and forget the 70, you, 70 and over age group here because there's a very small sample in that age group and I, I just couldn't delete it from this this uh, this spread but um, that sample is is really not worth uh, taking into account but basically what you see and is that yeah 50% of people in a way if you if you look across and there's no and there's no real you know um, uh, we can we could do this by age. We could also do it by gender. And there, there's really, when you ask the questions in this way, there's no great difference between those demographic um, characteristics. In fact, you know, contrary to a lot of the early research, you know, women don't fear crime heaps more than men. The elderly don't fear crime heaps more than the young. Th yes, there's 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 a little bit of that. But in fact, if you if you ask the questions that try and elicit responses about experiential fear, those those demographic differences um, tend to flatten out a hell of a lot. You just don't have the same sorts of um, uh, differences. Um, so we can look at that, and I was actually really worried about this result because um, what it seemed to say is, well, actually, a lot of people worry. Um, but drilling down beneath this, what you find is that people worry, but they don't worry very much. You know, this is, a, this is an expression of any kind of worry of, of, of four crime types over, um, over the, the, the sort of 12 months uh, of our, uh, our survey period. Um, but when you drill down, people worry, they don't worry very much. Um, you know, most people might have, have been, been able to Ind you know, indicate, say, you know, five or six times that they'd worried about a particular um, becoming a victim of a particular offence in the in the in the, in, the, in the previous twelve months. Um, uh, and so, what so what we can say is that. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just going to sort of touch on this pretty briefly, but is that people generally um, don't fear that much and that their fear, what we also asked is, did it, did it, did your, when you worried, did it have an effect on your quality of life? Did it change your behaviour negatively? And most, for, for, for many people, it actually doesn't. And this kind of reinforces what Jackson and Gray found as well. That around a quarter of individuals who said they were worried about crime reported that they took precautions, that these precautions made them feel safer, and that neither their precautions nor their worry reduced their quality of life. So, so a lot of what we could be counting as fear and worry about crime has no real effect on people's quality of life. Um, some of it does. And so by asking these, these different sorts of questions, we can start to drill down on those uh, you know, sectors of the population where fear is a real problem rather than where people just might think it's a bit of a problem. So in terms of our research, among those 49% you know, uh, of respondents who had worried at least once about victimisation across categories, 44.4% fell into the functional fear category. They took precautions. These precautions made them feel safer. And their worry and precautions did not affect their quality of life. So maybe this functional fear can, in some ways, be beneficial. Maybe it can have you know, these po positive implications. Ah, a whole range of different things. So everything from, uh, but this is a, this is a really good question actually. So everything from you know um, 
you know, say walking in groups of a, of a, of a night time to, um, you know, uh, some of it might be, you know, putting alarms in houses. Some, we asked a whole range of different things. Um, but this is what, where, what I want to get to actually is, is how much of the precaution, how, how, how what, what, what element of the precautions that people take um, could also be kind of seen as antisocial kinds of precautions. You know, it might make them feel safer, but it might mean they also curb what they do or curb their freedoms through those responses. Um, well, not if, it's, not, not if it's not negatively affecting their quality of life, but, uh, you know, people could say, yeah, we, we, you know, I've put an alarm on in my house, I'd feel better, but they might still not go out as much. Um, so what we're becoming interested in now is the question about Moving on from the functional fear question, how much fear can be functional, um, what sort of responses could be seen as kind of pro-social responses and what sort of responses could be seen as anti-social kind of responses? What sort of responses to worry are likely to help create and reinforce, say, a sense of community? Um, and we know, and that would in reinforce people's sense of belonging um, and hopefully have the Flow, flow on effect of reducing fear as well, or how much of it is simply a sort of individualistic kind of response um, that means, yes, maybe I, I don't feel so worried about crime, but it has no positive effect apart from on you know, the individual themselves. So um, they're, they're, I guess they're the sorts of questions we're interested in, in, in now. Um, did that answer your question kind of, or not really? <laughs> um, what we also found was that functional fear, the level, levels of functional fear decreased in areas where perceptions of neighbourhood disorder increased. So if you lived in a in an area where you had pretty negative evaluations of your neighbourhood, you thought it was disordered, um, you thought there were problems, uh, it was less likely that your fear was going to be functional, if you like, in that sense. Which I, which I guess you could, you could kind of think that, that that might well be the case. Okay, so getting to this question of what a pro-social fear might look like, and I'm going to stop soon because I'm, I'm aware we've, I've been going for a fair while. Um, what might a sort of collect, much more collective response to uh, worries about crime be? Well, you know, one, one, one good example in, in Australia uh, recently was um, a young uh, Muslim woman was uh, assaulted on public transport, and uh, you know there there, there be, was quite you know quite an outcry um, you know of, of 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 what had happened to uh, this person, and the, the, there was a whole um, massive social media response to that uh, the hashtag ride with me, uh, ride with me um, of of people saying that that you know kind of taking the social media and saying, you, you, you needn't be fearful, I, you, can, you can come ride with me. Um, I'll, be, I'll be your, you know, I'll be your um, companion. Um, but there's a whole range of other responses that people talked about in our research that might suggest something more positive, you know. Um, you know, this, this respondent says, well, I was thinking, try and come up with a photography thing. Go and take a photograph of something during the day and then go back at night. Like photography, maybe we get kids more into dancing, dance groups, more outside activity, ball games. You know, I think it's a good idea to connect people up with the local police. 